Hello, thanks for checking out my video. My name is Jeff Rolka. We had a little bit of a break from questions from comments. So we are gonna pick up where we left off. First question for today. Question, when I sing in the mask, should I keep my soft palate raised? I find it hard to use the mask when I'm singing with a raised soft palate. Is there like a sweet spot? Is it impossible to sing in mask with a raised soft palate? Thank you. No, far from it. A uh, raised soft palate to one degree or another is generally associated with singing in the mask or more brilliance or singer's formant in your sound. This, however, works in conjunction with the adduction of the vocal fold. So it's not just the lift of the soft palate that is creating that, it is also how the vocal fold is configured, how it's closing, adducting. One of the best exercises, and I'm particularly fond of it, is the NG sound or noise. I often call it the noise because it doesn't sound particularly nice, but it's a very useful exercise. The key is to get the rear of the tongue high enough so it blocks the mouth from the flow of air and all the airflow is going out your nose. So if you were to say the word hung and hang on to that last NG, those two consonants put together, the diphthong, hung, you'll feel the tongue lift and it touches the roof of your mouth, and this is forcing all the air out your nose and sinuses. And once you get that noise, you can then practice with it. And the thing is, is that when you get into the zona de passaggio and you start kind of lifting and getting ready for the transition over the secondo passaggio, you will really feel the difference in the way that the vocal fold is configuring. It will want to kind of lift off or release in a certain way. And if you resist it, you'll get that duller tone quality in the exercise. It will probably feel weird if you're not used to it but that brighter sound is the configuration of the lifted soft palate and proper elongation of the vocal fold where the cricothyroid muscles are elongating it. With a little bit of practice you can make that sound consistent and then you can release it. And work towards having a balanced mask vocal fold resonant kind of grounded sound as you move move through that area of your voice. Ultimately you can choose how much or how little of it you want but in my opinion it pays to get started with that neutral consistent tone quality in that area and above the secondo passaggio or above the break. I hope that helps. Great question. Thanks for asking that. Next one. Is there an upper limit to how many hours you should do vocal training daily if you don't have any immediate problems? Could maybe doing four to six hours daily have a negative long-term effect on my vocal health? I currently do the 40-minute warm-up, then practice covers for around an hour. I feel like that's not much and I want to do more now that I'm accustomed, but I also don't want to overdo it. I'm wondering if I should do the warm-up, then practice covers, or do dedicated vocal exercises in between, or just practice the covers more. I followed your advice on practicing the hard parts, but I feel like I've hit a plateau and won't progress further without more daily practice. Well, first of all, I commend you on your daily practice. That is the way to make progress as a musician of any stripe, whether you're a singer, guitar player, pianist, whatever it may be, daily practice is where it's at. Chopin used to say that if his students were practicing more than three hours a day, then they were wasting their time. So there's something to that, but there's a twist to that statement as well. Because what he also said was, is that don't practice your instrument for more than three hours. Do that, and then go and study music. Go and do some you know, like constructive listening. Go and study music theory. If you don't already study music theory or read music, learn to read music. 
you might do a bit of study into the genres that you are performing in. What are the performance practices for the genres that you are in? Do you have a website? Do you have a mailing list? Like all of those things aren't strictly speaking vocal practice. And you haven't said that you want a career in music, but if you're talking about practicing four to six hours a day, it sort of makes me think that maybe you want to have more than just a kind of hobbyist approach to your musical journey. So by all means, do your vocalizations, do your repertoire. You've mentioned doing covers, you haven't mentioned doing any writing. You might want to consider writing some songs too. If you're, if you're going to dedicate that amount of time, my suggestion to you is by all means, do your hour and a half to two hours of dedicated vocal practice. And FYI, make sure that that's dedicated as well. Put your phone away or turn off notifications so that you are focused entirely on the actual singing and there's no distractions. If you're using a computer, as many of us do during our practice these days, close tabs, close email, close all those distractions, all those kinds of things that would normally um, kind of bulk out our practice time that's not really practicing. And then if you still want more at the end of two hours, give or take, then if you're not reading music yet, learn to read music. If you don't study music theory yet, study music theory. Perhaps do a transcription. Perhaps write some songs. Maybe investigate the business side of things specific to the genres that you are interested in so that you are moving your entire career forward. Because the singing is perhaps the most fun part, but it's not the only part of having a career in music. And the more that you can expand your skill set now to incorporate all those other aspects of your career, the more time, money, and heartache I think that you will save in the long run, in the long kind of arc of your career in the music fields. Nice video, enjoyed it as always. Do you have another question, oh, do have another question for a future questions from comments. How do you use the word timbre? I have always thought of it as the peculiar combination of overtones, partials, that allow us to differ one voice from another, that which makes your voice your voice. Amy Lou Harris and Patsy Cline have beautiful voices, but they do not sound the same. And of course, baritones, tenors, mezzos, and sopranos sound different, even allowing for singing in different octaves. However, if a singer lightens his voice or sings more lyrically for a song, he may sound different, as he might if he darkens the voice or sings with a more spinto style. I think I'd still recognize the singer, but he would sound different. Is the new sound also timbre, or do musicians describe the change in sound differently? I very much enjoy your QA videos. I'm learning a lot. So before we move on to what my thoughts are on this, timbre, noun, the character or quality of a musical sound or voice as distinct from its pitch and intensity. And I kind of think, in a way, you've answered your own question. In a word, yes, timbre is the quality that you hear. You described it as lightning, like when, when a vocalist lightens their voice uh, as per, perhaps contrasts the way that they might normally sing. That is a different timbre or aspect. The tricky thing for us as vocalists is that that often means that there is a slight adjustment in our technique. And so it's not just timbre for us as vocalists, it is slightly changing the way that the vocal fold is configuring. And so there are different aspects to the way that we use our voices when we adjust timbre outside of a certain narrow parameter. So within, you know, this, there's very, very little adjustment that's occurring for me to uh, establish that change in timbre. But, there are those who might describe that as a different timbre. And that is true. It is a different timbre. It sounds different. There's a different tonal quality to my voice. However, as vocalists, I feel that it pays for us 
to identify that as a change not only in timbre, because certainly we want to recognize that, but also in the adduction of the vocal fold. That puts an action to the creation of that sound. So here, fully adducted, balanced, efficient configuration of the vocal mechanism. Depending on whom you're speaking to, they might say that that is poorly adducted. That's true. I might say that it is partially abducted or slightly separated. Am I saying the same thing with both those two statements? Absolutely. What's the difference? A matter of perspective. I think that too frequently we would call that poorly adducted because we are looking at it from one point of view where only a truly efficiently adducted vocal fold is considered correct. And in the popular styles especially, or even if you just want to change the feel, if even briefly, then partial abduction, partial separation, is a useful tool for us to use as an emotive vehicle. We're going to use that to elicit an emotional response from our listeners. Is that up to our artistic disposition? Absolutely. One person will say that's beautiful and it touches their heart. Another person will say it sounds like I'm singing poorly. Both are kind of right. Both are kind of wrong. That point, you know, when it comes to listeners' uh, enjoyment of it is subjective. Dear Sir Jeff Rolka, I would, I'm not knighted. I'm just Mr. Jeff, Jeff Rolka. Eve, that's all good, sir, but I appreciate that. What is the principal difference between baritenor and tenor and who am I then? Sorry for so many questions. I'll be happy to know your opinion. Really comfortable exercise. Happy New Year. Thank you. Obviously, I'm getting to these a little bit late. This one was also uh, sub submitted and it's very similar. Are baritary, bar tenors a real thing? I've been told that they are just baritones with a strong upper range or tenors who haven't quite transitioned. An excellent question and it depends, like so many things in music, on who you speak to. I have only recently started to do baritenor range warm-ups and videos specific to what is increasingly becoming a commonly used FOC or categorization of tenor range vocalists or male vocals. Some people will say it's not a thing. Some people will say it's absolutely a thing. I am not sure and I have not done the empirical studies to know one way or the other. What I can tell you is that a lot of the registration events, and registration events are like the, the transitions between primo, like the primo passaggio, between thyro retinoid dominant singing voice and the zona di passaggio, and then the secondo passaggio, where you're going from zona di passaggio to head voice range or cricothyroid dominant singing voice. Those registration events are a large part of determining one's FOC. Developing the voice so that they are clearly defined is critical to being able to know where they are. There are a couple things around this. One, Richard Miller often talks, there's a variety of tenors. It's not just tenor and baritone, right? There's lyric tenor, there is leggero tenor, there's tenor robusto, there's tenor spinto, there is Wagnerian tenors, and I think there's another, a tenorino is in there too. Maybe one more that I ha I've forgotten. Those are just tenors. And their secondo passaggi vary from here, F4. And I think the, the uh, there's one uh, tenorino, maybe as high as A4, but I would want to double check that before you quote me on it. My point is, is that that secondo passaggio has a lot to do with defining that individual's FOC. And there are a variety of them just for what are commonly considered to be tenors. A lot of times 
the secondo passaggi for bare tenors is quoted as being F4. That's consistent with tenor robusto. So a tenor robusto is a very full-bodied tenor who still has adequate access to their upper register, not necessarily as good of access as a lyric tenor, but they still have a great deal of that register, register that access, but they have more weight, more gravitas, if you will, though not as much gravitas as a baritone would. Specifically, the, the comparison there would really between, be between a lyric baritone and the tenor robusto. The lyric baritone, they have their secondo passaggio here at E4. And so you can see these two pitches, tenor robusto, lyric baritone. Those are the secondo passaggio points. Lyric baritone on the E, tenor robusto on the F. Not a lot of difference there. And I mean, it's just a semitone apart. And it's worth mentioning too, our voices often don't fit on the notes specifically. They're often in the cracks. The point here is that if you had a voice that was not fully developed, the vowels were not fully developed, fully functioning in alignment, registration event practice was not in play, vowel modifications was not very well developed, particularly there in the zona de passaggio, getting close to the secondo passaggio, the break if you prefer, then it would be not possible to tell if that individual were a lyric baritone or a tenor robusto. And unfortunately, a lot of times in the popular genres, those vowels, it's not necessary to get them really as well aligned as they would be if the person were trying to sing opera. Not that that's like a value thing, it's just the way it is. There's a lot more room for us to be ourselves in the popular genres. We don't have to get our vowels that aligned unless we want to do certain things, in which case it pays to work more at it. But if that individual hasn't done that practice to develop the alignment of the vowels, the actual location of the registration event may not have revealed itself sufficiently to make the determination. And it is that that often results in a baritenor classification, that there's not a real concrete idea of where that registration event is. Furthermore, it's worth mentioning too that the lyric baritone will, will often earn that classification just because of having more gravitas on the low end. And they can go on that way for quite some time before coming to the conclusion that they've actually kind of trained incorrectly and that the registration event is just a little bit higher. And going through a transition process will allow them to make that transition easier and they'll be singing more of the tenor robusto parts and things like that. For the most part, this doesn't come up in popular music. We don't necessarily have to develop our voices that much to get the kind of function that we need to sing a lot of popular songs. That being said, I think it's really beneficial to work on it, to obtain as much of that practice as you can, just in the interests of getting the fullest amount of function and having the longest, most sustainable usage of your voice throughout the duration of your singing career. And I use the word career to mean just your pursuit of it as a pastime or profession, if that's what you do. So are baritoners a thing? Kind of. Are they a real thing or is it an undeveloped voice? That depends on who you ask. Some people would say yes. Some people would say absolutely not, no. For my part, I am most interested in singers having the tools that will help them sing the best. If someone thinks of themselves as a baritoner and they want baritoner exercises, then I can construct those in a way that takes into account the, the chosen ideas around lower register response for that FOC, and as well takes into account the way that they would be addressing their secondo passaggio, their break, in the hopes that they will get a greater overall usage of their instrument and maybe 
in that usage, they will find that indeed their secondo passaggio is right between E and F and they are about as bare a tenor as you could be. Or maybe with practice, they'll find that they actually feel like it should be a little, little bit lower and they're more comfortable having more gravitas in the lower end and they'll train as a lyric baritone. Or they'll find that their comfort level and function through the zona de passaggio approaching the secondo passaggio, approaching E and F above middle C, gets better and better and more comfortable and more enjoyable. And they will then work towards that tenor, more tenor uh, disposition in their voices. They will be more like a tenor. That's, you know, comes down to the individual. And my goal is to give people the tools to explore their voices sustainably and make the most of them. Jeff, I've written a song where the verse is perfect for my voice, but the chorus is too high. Transposing the whole thing down helps the chorus, then harms the verses. Any advice? That's tricky. Depends a little bit on just how much it's too high. If you can, if you can work on registration events and gain that range, that could be a useful use of your time. Depends a little bit on how attached you are to the melody in the verse. It, and it also depends on how much you're transposing it. Down helps the chorus. You say transposing the whole thing down helps the chorus. I mean, down a semitone, down a whole step. Are we going like in just guitar friendly chords? If we're going in guitar friendly chords only, then those, those transitions are usually, those, those transpositions are usually pretty wide. So, I would start by putting the chorus in as comfortable a location as you can. Then you might be able to bring the verse up an octave. And if the verse isn't higher than the chorus, then you might be able to be in that same zone. A lot of, um, like when Glee was a thing, if you go back and listen to old song recordings of Glee, um, in particular the one I'm, I'm thinking of, they did the song, uh, somebody that I used to know, the Gautier song. And of course, when he sings it, there's this massive range change between the verses and choruses. And what they did for Glee is they transposed it all so that the chorus melody came down and then they brought the verse up an octave. So it was all in that same octave. That might be something that you can do as well. Um, so yeah, see if you can transpose in smaller increments Again, I don't know how, the increments that you're using, so that, that could be totally wrong right off the bat, but try going a couple semitones instead of a third or a fourth or a fifth or something. Um, try a big move, bringing the chorus into a comfortable area and then seeing if the verse can come up the octave. Uh, finally, you might have to consider, or maybe it's worth considering, adjusting the melody of the verse if it's too low when the chorus is in a comfortable location. And that's it. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you if you've chosen to subscribe. Have a lovely day. Bye.